Wow, this is amazing. 29 years ago, if you were into computers, you weren't playing video games in your basement. You weren't surfing the web. You were definitely not downloading MP3s. If you were lucky, you were in a computer club. And perhaps the most famous was Silicon Valley's homebrew computer club. Take a look. It was the first place where it was hip to be square. Silicon Valley's Menlo Park in 1975. 32 people gathered in a garage. Their intention? To create a free place to experiment with computers. It was called the Homebrew Club. Intel introduced its 8080 chip that year, and a small firm in Albuquerque announced a computer kit called the Altair. It was a clunky and unfriendly machine, but the Homebrew Club saw the opportunity and the necessity to improve on the Altair. Members were engineers, machinists, physicians, and even ham radio enthusiasts. They were hobbyists who had little access to computers outside the club, but knew there was something amazing that would come out of these meetings. And they were right. It was the first Apple computer. Steve Wozniak demonstrated his first computer design there, the Apple One. Other projects included Lee Felsenstein's first alphanumeric video display adapter and Harry Garland's color graphic card, to name just a few. The rest is computer history. By 1978, Silicon Valley had become the focal point for the industry. In a time before Bill Gates and Microsoft ruled the world, there was the homebrew club, the real activists and innovators who worked together to find a human purpose for the computer. Uh, joining us in the studio, I, I, this is, to me, this is what uh, doing this show for the last six years has, has culminated and has led up to. From the homebrew computer club on my far right, the designer of the Osborne One, co-inventor of the Sol 20, the Penny Whistle Modem, and moderator of the Home Brew Computer Club, Lee Felsenstein. Great to have you. <laughs> Next to him, the man who founded what I didn't just found out is the oldest surviving microcomputer manufacturer. <laughs> so it might be on life support, but it's still surviving. Started in 1974, Chromemco, of course, Harry Garland, creator of the Zazzler. <laughs> Next to Harry. The founder of Processor Technology Corp, co-inventor of the Sol 20, Bob Marsh. Great to have you, Bob. <laughs> On my left, a man who designed the Macintosh, Canon CAD, and author of Human Interface, the Human Interface wonderful book, Jeff Raskin. It's great. We've had you on before. Great to have you back. Next to him, firmware designer for the Apple I and systems designer for the Apple II, Alan Baum. Alan, welcome. And a man who uh, prefers to be known as the creator of the Bay Area's first dial-a-joke, but <laughs> also co-founder of Apple Computer, Steve Wozniak. <laughs> Harry just knocked me over because he brought in this cover. This was really what changed the world in 1975. Not just with you guys, but, uh, but Steve Ballmer came running into uh, their, uh, his and Bill Gates' uh, uh, dorm room and said, look, look! Look at this, you gotta see this! I mean, this really galvanized uh, people. This is, of course, the cover of the 1975 Popular Electronics where the Altair was announced. The world's first microcomputer kit. It's hard for us to imagine now, 29 years later, uh, what it was like in 1975. Do you remember your first meeting, Steve, and, and seeing this for the first time? Oh boy, it affected me so much. I had no idea what was going on when I went to the meeting. Alan, thank God, Alan invited me told me it's a group of people interested in video terminals and stuff like that, and I'd been working on such things, and when I arrived, here's a picture of a computer, and they had one on display, and I said, microcomputers, what are these things? I was kind of <laughs> scared. What, what was the environment like before this? I mean, w uh, could you work with a computer? I mean, how could you have a computer? Well, you could. This, uh, <laughs> you just couldn't. Who knows? You could, yeah. be, you could be in the university. You have a big mainframe, and, yeah. and you'd go to the priesthood with your punch cards yeah, and say, please, sir, may I have some time? They'd gotten so big and complicated, I had dropped out of computers and was being a musician. As soon as I saw that cover, I said, computers are going to get interesting again, and ran out and got one. Well, for me, my first year in college, I told my dad, I'm going to have a, a computer. I'm going to have the 4K Nova computer someday. And he said, costs as much as a house. <laughs> that's when I said, and I said, I said, I'll live in an apartment. And it was really that day, the first day of the Homebrew Computer Club, that I realized, finally, I am going to have the computer I wanted. Wow. Harry, is this your copy of the map? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So you, too, were affected that way. Oh, indeed. Yes. Did you, did you actually buy this on the newsstand? What happened? What was, what was your... Well, well, at that time, I had been writing articles with Roger Mellon for Popular Electronics for a number of years. Right. Uh, so this and, is your magazine, and really. so that, that, that yeah. was my magazine, and we first discovered uh, uh, about this computer before it came out in Popular Electronics. 
uh, in the offices, the editorial offices of the magazine, because we were talking to them about another story. Right. And uh, Les Sullivan, who was one of the key people, the technical editor of Popular Electronics, said, gosh, why don't you take and interface some of your stuff to this new Altair computer? Maybe it'll help it sell. I'm really worried about this thing. Did Ed Roberts bring it in? How did it get into the, uh, into the office? There? So uh, Les Sullivan actually had the Les Altair had it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. in his office in New York, and they were planning this big story. But it was a big risk for Popular Electronics. This was, a, I mean, a computer in a hobbyist, ma I mean, this is, you know, <laughs> is this really going to make sense? And so he was interested in gathering some support and rallying some of his, uh, his authors to support it. Lee, do you remember when you first saw this cover? Was this just as important to you? Yes, I, I believe uh, that uh, Bob Marsh showed it to me. This yeah. is the way I got magazines for free. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, what did Bob say? Do you remember? Look at this. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. You know, it's really interesting because, you know, if I said look at this now, to most people they go, yeah, huh, so? But for each and every one of you, it was a galvanizing experience to see this. Well, Bob said also, look at these pictures. It's clear this thing is a fake. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that. Yeah. And that meant there, that there was going to be a market for something. I mean, we, I, we all, I guess we were in this group because we knew and understood Something's that happening. people were going to want this. Something's happening. Well, you started. A, you were one of the founders of the group. You moderated the, the club. I From the fourth meeting on, yeah. yes. But I was on the first meeting. But uh, Gordon French. Gordon French and Fred Moore deserve the credit. Called the meeting. Okay. Yes. Okay. I should say the late Fred Moore. He died a few years yeah. ago. Yeah. And and what was their intent? What were they trying to do? Um, I think that they were they they believed they were going to hold some sort of hardware class. But then the altar came along and changed everything. It They'd changed from being a class to. Let's, let's build one and play with one. And well, not so much build one. The, the club meeting happened because the first, I think, serial number eight. Three. 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 Oh. First unit, <laughs> the review unit for, for the uh, uh, People's Computer Company, which is the only sort of p new uh, computer hobbyist publication right. there was, or like an underground paper. Uh, it, it was sent out for that. So everybody who had any connection with that uh, publication uh, got to see it. And we all couldn't figure out what to do with it. And eventually, it, it, it wound up in uh, Gordon French's garage uh, with the club convened around it, 32 people. <laughs> that was the first meeting at the, at the garage. And w were you all bowing down to it? Were you trying to, was, was Steve trying to take it apart? What was going on? That? <laughs> I was too scared to say anything. You, really? That was, uh, that was learning. Were oh you kind gosh. of in, in awe of the other people there? Or? I, I, was, I didn't think I'd come back because I really had been spending my time designing calculators at Hewlett Packard and I'd right. I'd gotten out of computers. Right. So I took home a data sheet. They passed out a data sheet. This was give out information. Right. That was the theme of the club started the first night. Took home a data sheet on a microprocessor and said, oh my gosh, this is like the computers I used to design in high right. school. So I was back in business. So, was that uh, kind of what everybody thought? Is let's let's make let's make something of this. Let's do. What, I mean, what what were you going see, for? Yeah. I couldn't do we were immediately. You said this is a business. Well, I didn't see it that way. I said, hey, this is going to be fun, interesting. Let's see. What right. Built one, and uh, met this stockbroker who was paying something like ten thousand dollars a month for time sharing. And I said, you know, if I could write that program that he's using on this little machine, I could buy this machine and sell it to him for a few months' rent and make a lot of money. Do you think, Alan, you guys were unique in seeing the potential of this? I mean, certainly the whole world didn't just jump up and say, hey, it's a computer. No, <laughs> I, I think we, we looked at it as this, this is coming, this critical mass is now is, is here. Yeah. We, we can do this now. Yeah. We couldn't do this before. A few people could do it before, but mostly companies, and now people can do it. Meanwhile, IBM's saying the entire world market for computers is about 18, and we're not going to even get anywhere near this business, right? I mean, it's, they didn't get it, right? It was, a, it was a little bit later in history than that. Yeah. Um, it was, it was, that was disruptive to their business model. <laughs> <laughs> so, to say the least. We're going to take a break. When we come back, I want to talk about your first, each of your first meetings, and then some of the things that came out of this, like, in, like this, Harry's Dazzler board. This is a fun, the fun story. We'll talk more when the screensavers continues. Stay right here. We're taking a trip down memory lane with some people who've really changed the world. Lee Felsenstein, Harry Garland, Bob Marsh, Jeff Raskin, Alan Baum, and uh, Steve Wozniak. Six of the people, there were many, of course, who were involved in the uh, 
uh, the Homebrew Computer Club, one of the first computer. You said it wasn't the first computer club. Oh, well, I was so talking the, about that, the People's Computer Center, which was sort of a drop-in center that had their own computer. So you're talking about how hard it was for anybody to play with a computer, but right. the People's Computer Center, you could drop in and use a computer and learn how to program. It was it a, a microcomputer? I mean, no. Oh, uh, no, they had a PDP-8, PDP which, PDP which was the first microcomputer. It was a, a mini-computer, really. Mini computer, yeah, computer, yeah. sorry. And, and, and you were writing in Fortran? What were you? <sighs> they were teaching basic. Focal. Basic, basic, and basic, focal. basic and games focal. are written in basic. Yeah. Now on this on this on this Altair, uh, you were programming at how? <laughs> Binary. You're, you're, <laughs> <programming. That's laughs> the difference. you're flipping <laughs> switches. <laughs> flipping yeah. switches. Right. It's pretty painful. painful. And what could it do? Anything? Besides a computer, well, a computer is a computer. It had no I/O. <laughs> we thought yeah. it could blink lights. It looks like an airplane cockpit, so it must be able to fly. <laughs> <laughs> we had our expectations raised by Steve Dompier, whom I wish could have been here. Um, he. Uh, was he had that's who got that, that one of those the serial number three um, in fact he drove to Albuquerque to get it um, so he was programming the minimum it could do which was to make a sorting program mm -hmm. right? so you can sort some numbers right. you can only read the numbers out by looking at the lights there's no paper tape no there's no terminal there's no keyboard nothing connected nothing. to it nothing lights. Just but lights. he had a <laughs> weather radio little radio sitting on top of it he was a pilot too so yeah. And he was listening to the radio, weather radio, and he's ran the program, and he could hear it go zip, 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 which was the loop of the program getting shorter and shorter as it did the. Uh, and it's coming out as RF and coming it's into the coming radio. It's coming out as noise that gets into the radio and comes out as music. <laughs> he did a music like program in 30 hours. No. He brought it to the th third meeting of the homebrew club. Didn't tell anybody what was going to happen. Set us up. Push the button, and it started playing the Fool on the Hill, <laughs> which was the first seat, bit of sheet music you could find. And after that, it went into Daisy Daisy, which for oh, those of us yes. who know, was the first song ever sung by a computer anywhere in 1960 by Hal. Max Matthews. Yeah, and then Hal 9000 sang it a little later on. In that, that was what it was referring to, yeah, yes. Right. So that just opened our eyes. It's like, yes! We can actually do stuff that you know nobody would even dream of doing because, of course, you get chased out if you tried to use a real computer for he this. He did it by flipping. So he must have had blisters on his fingers. I mean, yeah. you, you yeah, got to do it, it over the power failed, and he had to do it again. Yeah. yeah. He, 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 oh, the power failed when he first put it in, and then he had to re-enter so everything. There's no memory. Thing. You don't turn the thing off because you're going to have to start no, over. No, no, no flash. Well, you have to realize it wasn't much memory, so there wasn't that much you could toggle in the beginning. <laughs> Right. It, had it was 256 bytes. Yeah, 256 <laughs> bytes. Yeah. So that's not all. Each switch is a bit, so that's right. not a whole lot of switching. And, and now you can have uh, a gigabyte in this. In that, mm -hmm. in no, a little, in a little address. thumb drive. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I know. Waz walks around with two gigabyte, uh, two gigabyte thumb drive hanging around his neck with all his software on it. Does it? <laughs> but it's. But what's interesting is you guys still even. I mean, this is primitive. This is really primitive, even compared with the, the mini computers of the day. But you still saw something in there. Was it that it was on your desktop? That it was personal? What was it? Yeah, that, I, I had. I had had the experience, in fact, I had the machine that you wanted. I had a, because of my university connections, I had a data general Nova in the back of my truck. Ooh, I used to <laughs> Wait a minute, around. you had a Nova Ooh. in the back of your truck? Yeah. It's too bad you didn't have a Nova, you could have a Nova in the back of your truck. <laughs> 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 and so I knew what it meant to have a little yeah. computer that you could take wherever you wanted, have it on your desk, wheel it, I hate to wheel it. Into, and Why did you drive around with a Nova in the back of your truck? Because it was there. <laughs> <laughs> And it was this you, you go into a restaurant and you'd wheel in this. No! This, this com this computer. You'd come in with your computer. You'd come with your computer. You'd sit at the computer <laughs> alongside the table. You put the terminal on the table and you could work while you're eating at the restaurant. We do it today. But now we do it with laptops. Of as, course. Soon, as soon as I saw this, you know, I said, uh, I said, hey, now I can actually own one. I don't right. have to use universities. Right. Even though it was considerably primitive, did you immediately start saying, what more? Can we got to put a video display in this. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you got to put a terminal in there. What, uh, tell me about the, uh, the first video display card. Was that yours, Lee? Or? Well, uh, we have to break it up. Harry was first with the video graphics card, the okay. one you're holding. This is the Dazzler. The Dazzler. Now, is this S100? This predates that, S100. That is S100. That this is, is S100. S100. Okay, so that's the original bus. Yeah, right. We looked at what we could find in the documentation, and finally we looked at the actual thing, the, the Altair, and we saw empty sockets. Right. And that was the future. Right. And Bob immediately started a company in his mind and, uh, to, to fill <laughs> those processor sockets. technology, yeah. Altair um, <clears throat> made the grave mistake of including a manual with all the schemat schematics. Oh, <laughs> my. 
yeah. Altair computer, and so it was a relatively trivial task to design equipment to run on there. Well, it's called the Altair bus before it was the S100. But in a way, it was Harry and I who invented the term S100. Oh, really? Yep. Yeah, yeah so Kremenko, of course, we, was... We had a bit too much to drink at a trade show in Atlantic <laughs> City, <laughs> and we decided... On the airplane going there. Oh, Are right, there is there 100 pins on here? Is that why yeah, it's there's 100 pins yeah. on there. 100 yes. pins on there. What's the S stand for? Standard. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to call it the Century Bus, but he the figured that it would be better if it was a really dull name. It would take off better. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> anyway, that's that's what I'm doing. I like yeah. that very much. That's very good. Yeah. So Bob and I had rented a garage. Actually, before this happened, and Bob was casting around for something to build. I was just being a design consultant. Suddenly, there were things to design. Yeah. And it started out with a memory board, a ROM board, and a uh, an, uh, just a serial parallel interface. But I had published a little mimeographed specification for what I called the, the Tom Swift terminal. Oh, yeah. Or a convivial cybernetic device, <laughs> uh, where I basically set down in specification form what a modular bus-oriented personal computer could look like. I never built it. And in effect, did the thinking about how do you couple video to this economically to get text out. And that set me up so that Bob, uh, not too much later, said, we will pay you to design the Tom Swift terminal if you design it our way. And I did. And the, that became the video display module VDM1. Um, and that was 64 characters per line, 16 lines. The screen flashed whenever you uh, used it because the memory was so slow. But that basically was copied and improved by Radio Shack for the TRS-80. And it went on to become more or less the standard uh, architecture of uh, text display. You, you said an interesting thing, he published the schematics. I mean, that was kind of, it, it was very open, yes. and that was the spirit at the time, was a, a spirit of sharing, of openness, we'll show you how to do it, you do some stuff. Not everybody was thrilled about that. Uh, in fact, we're going to come back in just a bit and talk about a visit from a young man who was very unhappy, in fact, about the openness of the Homebrew Computer Club. <laughs> we'll talk about that, a young man who went on to some big things when the screensavers continue. Stay right here. Nineteen seventy five Silicon Valley. It wasn't really that long ago in a lot of ways. It's 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 recent history and yet in a computer world, it's ancient history. We're talking about the Homebrew Computer Club, the, the club that in many ways uh, started all and was certainly fertile ground for uh, what became the personal computer revolution. Uh, not everybody's so happy about the free spirits at the Homebrew Computer Club, right? I hear a young Bill Gates wrote you a what nasty letter, didn't he? What, what happened there? What's the story there? Harry, do you want to tell that story? Sure. Uh, it was um, certainly a, a letter that he wrote, and at that time, uh, the only significant software for the Altair computer was something uh, called Altair Basic, which you got on paper tape. And if you were one of those fortunate few that had a RS-232 port and a teletype, <laughs> that could read paper tape, then you in fact could load this paper tape into your, your computer. It was the only way to do it. Maybe, uh, maybe is exactly right. Maybe. And uh, this was uh, sold by MITS, who made the Altair computer, but it was licensed from uh, to, to two young gentlemen, one who took off time from Harvard to, to write this, and his name, of course, was, was Bill Gates. And the well, other, Paul Allen, we should give and, credit and, to and since he owns his channel. And, and Paul Allen was the other. <laughs> and Paul Allen was the other. Yeah, he, did absolutely. The he did the work. <laughs> yeah, well, there's always a debate there about yeah. who did the work. We won't get yeah. into that. We won't get into that. But, but one thing about an RS, two, uh, uh, if you have an RS-232 port and a teletype, this teletype has both a reader and a punch. Yeah. So you could put the paper tape in one side uh -huh. and get a copy of the paper tape out the other side. Push the button. It's and, automatic. And, yes. And this is probably the world's first case of software piracy. It and started then and it hasn't stopped. It hasn't yeah. stopped. <laughs> Did he come to the club actually? Yes. Yeah, he, he came and he made a presentation, very impassioned. And uh, it was really with a lot of foresight. He saw that if this were going to continue, where copies were made and the software manufacturer, the people who put the intellectual property into the software didn't get the resources, there would be no more software. Yeah. So he made an impassioned plea to stop the copying of software. But it was also part of what the revolution was all about, because once things are bits, it's pretty darn hard to hold on to them. And right. that's kind of what's happened. I mean, it's, it's given us all this flexibility and, and power. Steve, you were saying that it didn't, 
these well, guys was, had some vision, but you, know you didn't really the, share that? Product, there's product categories and this and that, and it's kind of logical. To me, my, I was so influenced. I'd had a computer bug when I was young. Right. Kept up a sideline hobby of designing projects of my own, but really came back into this club, and it was the types of people, their personalities, how they spoke, how they were excited about what these computers of the future could possibly lead to that really inspired me to get back into it and yeah. try to contribute my stuff. and. Um, it was, you know, a little bit of everyone here influenced me. It was, uh, I mean, Harry's Kremenko Dazzler. I don't even know if I saw it demoed, but hearing about color made me think, God, you want to put color in a computer, don't you? Right. And fortunately, right. five years before, I had designed and built a little tiny 8-bit, 256-byte computer. So I've been through the switches and lights, and you know what? Wanted to do something like more human like our calculators at Hewlett Packard. And the keyboard was really key start. And luckily, I'd come in with a video terminal with a human keyboard. And I said, skip that airplane cockpit stuff. Right. You know? And then, then Lee and Bob came out with the, the, the processor technology Sol after the Apple I, right. a keyboard-based computer. Right. And that was the paradigm that continued. And then the Apple II came. And so was, you just kind of ping-ponged off each other, standing on each other's shoulders, and uh, this good idea, that good idea. It was, well, it was like sharing. clicking into yeah. what this computer for people should finally look like was all all uh, starting did, right there in that club. Did at any point spin off where people start saying, hey, maybe there's some money in this. I'm going to hold on and not, make, not, not give this stuff away. Well, well you not, besides not Bill me, Gates. Not me, the Apple One. Apple One came down to every meeting, and I thought, this is a club. But everybody's talking sharing. We're passing out. I would write software. I wouldn't copyright it or something. Just right. put it in the club mm -hmm. newsletter. I would design the Apple One, pass out schematics so people could build their own cheaply. There's the there's an Apple one in the uh, in the wooden case there, but it wasn't. It didn't come, you didn't come in with a case. Did you come in? You came in first with the schematics. Did you eventually build a board and eventually, bring that in? Oh, yeah. eventually built a board. By the time I had the schematics, I had the board, and the board could be laid down with some wires on a keyboard and my Sears TV. I'd carry it in. And it was, uh, it's, hey, it's the only output device you have for free. I couldn't afford a $400 processor either, so I had a $20 processor. But um, I could type in some hexadecimal codes that I had figured out how to get a program into it and show something on a screen step by step. Every few weeks, I'd bring in a demo and show it. He's like, develop the basic language, because, you know, I could sniff the air. And here was Bill Gates and his basic. And I just sort of knew that somehow the world was going to go basic. And I'd yeah. never used basic. And I'd never written a computer language or really studied, except I had some mimeograph notes that Alan sent me when he was a student at MIT about computer um, um, interpreter design. So I wrote this basic and, you know, it showed it off every step of the way, adding some, some commands to it, you know? It must have it been was so, so exciting. Fun. It must have been so fun to see this every week, something new, something exciting. Right. I, I, my job was to stand up there and not say anything, but keep other people from talking over each other. <laughs> The, the pr process was one person at a time got 90 seconds maximum. This was varied, but 90 <laughs> seconds maximum to say whatever they wanted. They had to stand up so people could identify them. That meant they knew who they wanted to talk to. That's your pr secondary information. I want to talk to this guy. Uh, and so just keep doing one at a time. And then when the inevitable back and forth conversations or, and arguments started, I had to break it up. And I, I, I learned to use humor. And, and body language and the pointer and so forth for that. Lee won't say this about himself, but he was very funny. And I think, I think that without the way that Lee ran those meetings, it never would have worked. In fact, I would go there half just to see you perform. <laughs> Bring Master Lee to that. that. Yeah. And, and <laughs> nobody had to pay admission. <laughs> Darn it, you see, you had an opportunity. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back, find out what, in the aftermath of the uh, Homebrew Computer Club, what happened next when the screensavers continue. Stay right here. Welcome back to the Screen Savers. We're continuing our conversation with the legendary members of the Homebrew Computer Club. I called it a users group, but, but uh, Waz pointed out quite correctly, you weren't users, you were creators. There was nothing, you couldn't just sit down and use somebody's computer. You, if you wanted to do it, you had to make it. Tell me about the Sol uh, 20 a little bit, Bob. What, what, was that, uh, what was that all about? Well, first of all, the, the idea for the, for the company that I was with came in the very first computer meeting when I saw number three and saw all the documentation and decided to build I could do own. that. It was only a few months later we decided to build our own computer. Yeah. And you named it after Saul, which we is We named it good. after Les Solomon, yeah. actually, the editor of Popular Electronics. Because yeah. we figured by bribing him that way, <laughs> he put it in the cover. Make sure it got on. And it, it actually worked. <laughs> so it was one of our successes. Um, we didn't actually, we were probably a year late. In the break, we were saying that a year was like a lifetime, and we were yeah. actually a year late delivering those computers. It wasn't until about the same time as the Apple II that the Saul 20 actually came right. out. But it was one of the very first computers that was completely integrated in one package so that you, if you had the monitor on top of the TV um, and it had its built-in keyboard memory, everything in there, you could just plunk it down on your desk thing. and start using it. it uh, that right is away. assuming you knew how to program. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't realize or you that. had a prior to paper tape. 
I didn't realize the connection because I was also working for less uh, uh, and and writing for Popular Electronics. But do you realize that we need a new computer club? I mean, things have gotten so static. And even a Mac has gotten hard to use. They're complicated. Right. The, one of the reasons why I like the little machines is that the big machines have gotten too complicated to use. And now, but you've always said that. Yeah, and I, I still say it. You're still yeah. saying it. Still <laughs> right. Absolutely. Uh, and he's still right. Yeah. And he's yeah. still right. Now, Harry, you started Crememco. Yes. And now, I, at the beginning, I said it's still going. It's it's going concern still? Uh, yes, although it's, we, we sold it to a large company. So right. it's been acquired and right. it's kind of lost some of its identity, but uh, uh, it's still a going concern. I remember those Crememco's S100s. Oh, those beautiful uh, cages. Those were great. Those were great computers. Lee is still, I know, doing a lot with computers. It's still the comic, but also still uh, <laughs> spreading the computer. Uh, uh, gospel yeah, uh, everywhere around the world. Yeah, I, I see an industry uh, that will develop in the third world, in the developing world, extending the telecommunication system through wireless, call it last kilometer. Right. Um, the systems can be built using open source software and 802.11 uh, that are cheap enough so that the people who are using them can actually own them and operate them. Uh, and that puts them not only into the local telecommunications grid, right. but also out onto the internet because Many of them will have relatives and friends living around the world, and hooking them up, uh, they know they need it, and uh, it's uh, <laughs> it's going to be fun doing yeah. it. Steve is doing wireless too. I know you're interested in the wireless, and we shouldn't we sh we shan't mention well, well, what you're doing. A lot of the world's doing, doing wireless these days. Yeah, it's pretty pretty <laughs> exciting. So you're still in the computer industry, would you say? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I love baiting him. <laughs> I wouldn't say it. I'm, I'm in the, there's other industries there's related. related. So after the Apple One, the Apple Two, and of course uh, the world changed. I mean, uh, that really that really kind of commercialized the thing and and took off like crazy. Did that change yep. for you guys? You feel like that? Oh no, it's not ours anymore. It's the world's. Or did you? Did you? It's well, we started out too. The early products came with a computer and a programming language, just right. like the ones that right. the, the hobby computers. Not so different. Club. Yeah. And somebody had to sit down and read a little book and learn, oh, I can write a couple simple programs. We made it very simple back right. in those days. But then if you had a, a need, you fulfilled it by writing a program. Right. Today, you're told, here's what your needs are, and here's what the solutions are, and you buy it from us. And Alan, it's when all you done. were working on it, did you kind of know that this is how, how important this was and, and what a big revolution this was? No, I don't think I did. I, I, didn't, I didn't see that. I just saw it as sort of instant gratification. Because you'd come from designing <laughs> big computers. And I ended up there too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Still doing and, it. And as we mentioned, Jeff is still fighting the fight to make these darn things a little bit easier to but, use. But at least people are still using Macintoshes. I can't believe it. It's been 25 years since they were released, and people are still using Macintoshes. Well, it's wonderful. Speaking for myself, we love our Macintoshes. <laughs> and thank you, all of you, for the difference that you made. You changed the world. We are all uh, very grateful to uh, the Homebrew Computer Club. I know you guys are doing it for fun and because you loved it. But as beneficiaries of your work, we really thank you. It was really an amazing revolution that started in 1975 in Menlo Park. Stay where you are. We're going to come back. Say goodbye when the screensavers continue. You know, I thought I'd bring these young guys in here with us old guys in the background. How, when, what year were you born? 77. Kevin Rose. 77? Oh, 72. So you can see that these guys, he was a baby. He wasn't even born when all this began. <laughs> But you were saying, Bob Marsh, that what Yoshi's doing is not so very different. No, I think he should get the uh, Homebrew Club Medal of Honor for his work on for the mods. mods. That was exactly yeah. the spirit. I of think what we have a quorum here and should vote on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, I can't do the same as Lee, though. I have to well, say, I, I'll propose him for the Strip Phillips Screw Award for finding a use for something previously thought useless. Now, that's, <laughs> that's what I propose. The Strip Phillips, Phillips Screw Award. <laughs> do you have it mounted on a little, a, a little plaque there or anything like I'm that? I'm sure you we can find arrange that. <laughs> well. Talking about 70s, and it was in 1966 that I built my first graphic input device. Wow, wow. So, you know, it's really, the, which was a mouse like thing? or it was, it, Well, it was built on a big drawing board and uh -huh. it had crossed wires and 10 turn pots and things. Yeah. But, uh, but I needed to input, I wanted to input music. Bob was saying we're kind of st uh, stagnated. Nothing great's happened in, in 12 years or so. Evolutionary so. is what I said. Evolutionary. You th where's the next big thing coming from? Anybody? Suggestion? Mm, from me, of course. Jeff Raskin. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give, does he have an award sure. for that, Lee Felsenstein? <laughs> no, Raskin's his own category. <laughs> well, there's so many other people who are part of the uh, Homebrew Club, and, and I wish we could have gotten you all on the stage. For those who are watching at home, we'll do this again. You come back. We want you all, right? Thank you. And Gordon and everybody else should come back, and we'll do this again, because it's, uh, it's really fun to have you. Pretty neat, huh? It's cool stuff. Isn't it amazing? Yes. Yeah. 
All right. We thank you for joining us on this edition of the Screen Savers. Kevin Rose, Yoshi, we're going to be back next week. We've got a great week of shows. But uh, it's just nice once in a while to take a trip back in time through memory lane with Lee Felsenstein and Harry Garland. And, uh, and uh, i got to get everybody in right order. Bob Marsh, Jeff Raskin, Alan Baum, and Steve Wozniak. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we'll see you next time on the Screen Savers. Night-night.